my favorite thing about working in healthcare is the people. This industry brings together brilliant, highly motivated individuals who are driven by the opportunity to make a difference. My name is Hallie Teko, and this is The Heart of Healthcare, a podcast where I'll be introducing you to the people on the ground, moving the needle in public health and medicine. Today's guest I found on Twitter after he went viral from live tweeting his experience participating in a clinical trial. On April 3rd, he tweeted, tomorrow I'm going to be deliberately infected with dysentery and kept in a quarantine facility for 11 days as part of a vaccine clinical trial. That sounds dark, but I assure you, I am extremely excited to overshare this journey with everyone. Jake Eberts, then went on to tell his story in an incredibly humorous way, and I just needed to know more. The clinical trial he participated in was led by the Center for Vaccine Development and Global Health at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. They are working on a vaccine for dysentery, which is a painful intestinal infection that causes severe bloody diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting. Jake, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Let's start from the beginning. Tell us about how you found out about this clinical trial and why you decided to sign up. Right. So it's kind of a little bit of a circuitous sort of route. Earlier last year, I sort of turned off all like personalization of ads on Instagram and other social media platforms after having read, you know, all the horrible things big tech does with our data. And I think the direct result of that was getting a lot less or a lot more broadly targeted advertisements. So uh, am I an adult in the DMV area? Um, And so I started getting a lot of clinical trial ads. Uh, I live in DC and the National Institutes of Health is here along with several military research centers. And so there are a lot of clinical trials here uh, per capita here and, and in Maryland. And so I was scrolling through Instagram one day and I saw a very clever Oregon Trail themed ad saying you had died of dysentery by the Center for Vaccine Development at the University Mm. of Maryland. They knew their audience. Right. um, Because I had seen (laughs) other ones that are just very boring, kind of like screenshots of a clinical trial research page or like a sign up page. And to people, I'm like, I just tap past those. Instagram is is not (laughs) the platform for deep, sustained engagement with medical literature, I'm afraid. And so (laughs) I, I, but the Oregon Trail one made me kind of chuckle and I was just genuinely curious. And so I tapped on it. You wanted to reward their creativity. Right. And, And I will say, I will give credit to the CBD. They have uh, whoever's their uh, graphic designer or marketing person is doing a very good job with all their trials. There's definitely a balance between frivolity and the seriousness of the underlying diseases, and they strike that balance very well. Yeah. But yeah, so I clicked on the ad kind of on a whim. I just threw my name in. I figured there was a decent chance that there might be some disqualifying condition. I had wanted to for a while, kind of, especially I think in the wake of COVID, I was very drawn to the idea of you know, using myself in a clinical trial as a, as a guinea pig. I am a, a, mm. a social sciences major who is not going to be saving humans anytime soon as part of my day to day. So I figured that might be a good way to uh, give back. And this was the first one that you've done. Yeah. I mean, I'd done like little psych trials in college for $25 mm. or whatever. Um, yeah. But uh, this was the, the, this is definitely the first of any kind of serious clinical trial I've ever done. And what is what is your day job and what did your manager think when you said you were going to leave for 11 days to get dysentery? I work at a um, progressive, I guess, research consulting firm. Um, we do a okay. lot of sort of due diligence and then political research and things like that. My managers were bemused, but I mean, I, I sent a message being like, hi, like I'm going to ask for about a week <laughs> off for dysentery. <laughs> and they're fun people. And they were like, well, uh, we discussed and the dysentery council has approved your request. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, part of this too, I think, you know, without it, before the pandemic, when all of us working from home for you know well over a year, I don't think this would have been possible. But mm-hmm. even, I mean, I knew the details of the trial were such that, yes, we're all going to get exposed to or challenged with Shigella, which is the bacteria that causes shigellosis and then can in turn lead to dysentery. 
but we're not all going to be sick the entire time always. And I figured I might also get the vaccine and be totally fine for 11 days. So at the very <laughs> least, I was I was able to work you're, for a couple of days. Let me roll there's, the dice. <laughs> yeah, no, there was definitely, there was a lot of risk calculation. I had at one point a little sticky notes kick. So we have like a 50% chance getting the placebo <laughs> times $7,350. Like it was I, definitely, there was a uh, some utilitarian calculation going on in yeah, there. Yeah. But yeah, my bosses were very supportive. And so were my family, my mother was equal parts terrified and proud. And overall, again, this definitely would not have happened, I think, easily before the pandemic. So sort of silver lining of that is random knowledge workers in office buildings can, can are now free to get dysentery if they want to <laughs> and still be able to be productive members yeah. of society. Okay, so they started by giving half the participants a double blind study. So half the participants right. got the vaccine and half got the placebo. I think you tweeted that you f- knew that you got the placebo. Like, you, so I, you, I, yeah. I, I said this before I went hilariously viral. My tweeting about this was never intended to reach beyond my little niche of followers. But I suspected that I got the the placebo. But that was also just, I joked based in part on like my luck in life. And also, uh, (laughs) I mean, there's no soreness in the vaccine, like when I got Mm. injected, but that might also just be that that's, you know, I mean, after the flu shot, I don't, I don't get sore either. So yeah, and there were two injections, one in February and one in March, each Mm. month apart. And we were either given the like a placebo saline injection or like the real deal, but they're not going to, there's still two more cohorts for this study to run. And so we're not going to know for a while. Ah, Um, interesting. So so nobody knows. I don't, I don't technically know. I mean, if I did, I was one of the worst hit according to the attending doctor. (laughs) Um, So if I did get the real vaccine, that's probably bad news for the researchers. That's really not good for the trial. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But again, it's technically just a 50, 50% chance. Yeah. Okay, so then at what point did they give you the dysentery smoothie and yeah. tell us about what it tasted like? It was, so it actually wasn't, I mean, it was disgusting because we, you intellectually, like you're like, I know what is in this nasty little yeah. plastic cup of, of clear water. They gave it to us at exactly 11.04 on Wednesday morning, April, I believe 6th, the first Wednesday of April. They were, you know, carefully watching the time because they had to meticulously record every single detail whenever we got our vitals checked and all of that. And they brought us into a little nurse's station and all the other, the doctors and nurses were all wearing like not hazmat suits but like the like face guards and like the re- like the gloves and the gowns yeah. and i was like oh and i'm just sitting there in my scrub and like oh yeah i'm about to ingest a, a potentially deadly disease <laughs> that yeah. kind of hit me so we first had to drink a buffer solution of sodium bicarbonate to like help neutralize the acids in our stomach shigella is particularly a wily one because unlike most diseases like cholera, for instance, it's very resistant to the stomach acid, which is why you need a very small number of live organisms to cause an infection. Ah, but they still okay. wanted to like just make sure that that we actually got it. <laughs> you know, they were paying yeah. us a lot of money and spending a lot of money on the trial. So like <laughs> we've got to make sure. And so we took we drank the little sodium bicarbonate solution, which just tasted kind of like slightly salty water waited a minute or two, and then we drank the little shot of the Shigella smoothie. And that basically just tasted kind of like slightly salty, slightly oily water. There were, uh, but it, it contained, it was supposed to contain around a target of about 1,500 like live colonies of the uh, Shigella flexneri, wow. which is one of the two subspecies of the Shigella genus, or species of the Shigella genus that primarily causes di- Shigellosis and oh. dysentery. And yeah, and then after it was kind of anticlimactic, I joked about wanting to play shots by Little John uh, or LMFAO featuring Little John. Um, but it turns out when you take a video on your iPhone, you can't also play music at the same time, which is mm. a tragic design oversight by the people you need in TikTok Cupertino. For that. But we took the shot and then we went back. We, did, we couldn't eat anything for 90 minutes afterwards. So we all had to kind of stay in the lounge and just sit mm. there and contemplate what just happened. But that was about it. It was rather anticlimactic in that sense. Yeah. Did they tell you when the symptoms would kick in if you were to? They told us that the doctor, so Dr. Chun, who is one of the lead researchers in the study, said that the fastest, and he's like a gastroenteric specialist who's been doing this for like longer than I've been alive. He said the fastest he'd ever seen turnaround for a diarrheal disease was something like 18 hours ish, Um, but they didn't really expect it to kick in until at least 24 to 48 hours. Um, Mm. There was one person who did get sick. And they had diarrhea and a fever the next day on Thursday. So we took it Wednesday, but theirs mm-hmm. didn't progress as severely as mine did. And then, yeah, so for it, you thought it, you might have been free, and then I, yeah, I was, I was sick. <laughs> I felt bad, but I was just like, okay, thank God, it's not me. Um, 
But in retrospect, he had it much better overall because I had a nasty time with it. But yeah. for me, it was a little over 36 hours later. It was like in the middle of the night, early Friday morning, like 2 or 3 a.m., where I woke up just kind of feeling weird and like something uh. was definitely going on. Went to the bathroom. Everything was normal there, but I just definitely, like, I could tell something was was amiss. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And then over the course of that Friday, things deteriorated pretty rapidly. And around the same time, like Friday was when I think a bunch of people started getting it. And then Saturday too. <laughs> At the end of the day, there were 16 of us in that cohort, and four of us saw basically no symptoms. And then uh, it seems like another six or so had pretty mild illnesses, and then another six or so had pretty severe illness. But again, this is okay. kind of my perceptions and like yeah. talking to the nurses as opposed to the official data. And of those, I had one of the most rapid and severe onsets, if not the most <laughs> rapid and severe onset, which is <laughs> kind of funny because I was tweeting through it and it would have been a little bit uh, disappointing, I guess, if I had, had just been like, nope, I'm fine. So in a way, I was cosmically asking for it by setting myself up there. But, you were. But uh, you was, can't get your 15 minutes of fame with a boring story. Right, exactly. You need um, it to be, yeah. And dysentery, <laughs> shockingly, dysentery is one of the things that's kind of hard to fake. So it was it was mm. a genuine sort of, Yeah. It was, it was an experience. There was a period where we hadn't heard from you in a while. Yeah. I, so what happened was I tweeted in the middle of the night. I woke up and I was like, just feeling gross, but I was still fine. And so I tweeted like, you can guess why I'm up at, you know, four o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Damn it. You know, this is, <laughs> I think <laughs> Here I got we go. it. I tried to sleep. I slept a few more hours. We had to get vitals checked at least three times a day. So I woke up at like eight and got my vitals checked and things were looking already a little bit iffy, if I remember correctly. Mm. And then over the next six hours, we had another vitals check at like two. And by that point, I was like, it was bad. Um, the worst part actually was, so I definitely started having diarrhea. The worst part for me actually was the fever and the chills and the fatigue, like just moving mm -hmm. felt like a Herculean task, just getting up, moving to the bathroom, washing my hands. Each one of those felt like just yeah. a monumental effort and I was freezing. And, oh. and by two o'clock I go to get my vitals checks and nurses are like, okay, yeah, this, we're going to keep an eye on you because you're not doing great. I definitely developed a low grade fever by that point. And then over the next four hours is when things got really, really ugly. And so surprisingly, at least for me, the diary was not the worst part. It really was like the fatigue. I could barely move. I was, mm -hmm. I, despite my intent on drinking as much Gatorade as I could, I, I got dehydrated pretty quickly. And it really, things really came to head, I guess, around two. So I wasn't tweeting at this point at all that day as compared to the previous days when I'd been manically tweeting every thought that passed through my head <laughs> every, yeah. every half hour. And so I guess around three or four, and again, the time is a little fuzzy here because I was not uh, bar not barely conscious, but definitely less conscious than I would have liked to have been. Yeah, It was just rough. And so at one point I go to the bathroom and not to get into gory detail, but I'm sure your listeners know that this is a podcast about a dysentery trial. So I'm assuming yeah, they're, they know people. what they're signing up for. We can, yeah. Uh, right. Uh, and so we had to take stool sample. Like every time we went to the bathroom, we had to take a stool sample. Like we did collect all of it and like uh, and I'm sure many of your listeners are familiar with it, but it's like a little inverse hat looking thing. I call it the handmaid's tail bonnet. It's like a plastic thing that just catches it mm. all. And the purpose of that was, I'm sure they were running lots of tests on that for just, you know, whatever study purposes. And then also to measure fluid loss. And if we had diarrhea, we had to then take a corresponding amount of oral rehydration salts. It was a little bit of a Kafka's bureaucratic process to go to the bathroom. And that was annoying, but also something that was completely understandable. Yeah, They wanted you to be sick enough that they, they could get scientific information out of this, right. but they don't want to kill They're not you. trying to kill me. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. And so I, at one, so again, at four o'clock, I like go to the bathroom again. At this point, I'm going to the bathroom at least like every hour and a half or so. And it was 10 or 11 times on Friday I had to go to the bathroom. And I was just I felt like death. Every yeah. single step of that process, like going to the bathroom, like I walk into the bathroom, I distinctly remember being like, I am too tired for this. So even before I sit in wow. the toilet, I just lie down on the floor for like five minutes, just like uh. rest. And then I get into the toilet, I go to the bathroom, I cover up the sample, and then I just sit on the ground for like five mm. minutes. And at this point, the nurse is like outside, like very gently, but sort of like, Jake, what you doing in there? And I'm like, <laughs> and you oh. just moan. And I'm like oh. grunting, like I'm alive. And I was not a happy camper. And so what must have taken 30 minutes, I finally like opened, like washed my hands, opened the door and a team of nurses basically to drag me into a bed. They looked at my, I believe they looked at my urine and they're like, okay, yeah, you're extremely dehydrated. The attending doctor, Dr. Chun walks in and the, one of the lead researchers and he starts doing some tests and they take my vitals and they're like, okay, yeah, this is not pretty. And so they immediately put me on an IV and I hate IVs. I can deal yeah. with needles fine, but I was so out of it at this point that I did not care over the course of that evening, they gave me five liters of fluid 
And uh, wow. at six o'clock, they made the call. Um, there is, there's definitely a bunch of, so there are, I mean, as with any clinical trial, I imagine there are, yeah, there is a threshold of severity for illness at which point they administer antibiotics because they mm. obviously want to capture data on your innate immune response. Yeah. Um, and so they're like, all right, he's got it. He's got dysentery. Right. Let's, and let's... so, <laughs> exactly. And so I had, uh, and dysentery, of course, being, so shigellosis is the disease that shigella causes and it's, you know, diarrhea is gastroenteric disease, diarrhea all these other nasty things. Dysentery is the symptom, I guess, is, is bloody diarrhea, specifically from damage to the, ah. the lining of the gastrointestinal yeah. tract. Because Shigella, and again, it is, I'm a layman, I'm a political science major, so yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I'm but sure. It sounds like you learned a lot about this, though. Did do a lot of reading. I was like, oh, yeah. I wonder what's going on in my body right now. Yeah. <laughs> it turns yeah. out not some, some not fun things, but the Shigella travels through the lining, uh, the cells of the lining of the intestine, and, and basically causes what what the doctor described as analogs to scrapes and in really severe cases that can perforate the, the bowel, but that's not, uh, that was not a risk for us because we had modern medical care, but that's where the blood comes in. And so that's kind of the mark of dysentery. And so I had, I developed full on dysentery at that point, not just diarrhea. And at six o'clock, my Oof. fever was, was reaching 103 and still climbing. And so that was, that triggered the threshold where they're like, okay, we're going to give you a uh, superfloxacin early. And it was remarkable because that was around six o'clock and within, and I'm sure part of this was the IV fluids too, within four hours or so, I was able to tweet again and be like, I'm alive. Um, <laughs> and I still felt awful, but I was not like, cata like feeling catatonic on the edge of yeah. a cliff. The nurses were super helpful and super kind. I like, I, had to be under four blankets and a little space heater because I was just freezing. Aww. But again, they within, keep it cold in hospitals, right? Right. Well, yeah. And so this was a specifically <laughs> built, like contracted isolation facility. So it was kind of like a, a junior hospital. Like it had the like the I guess the structure of it with the hospital beds and like nurses stations and like basic equipment. But it wasn't like as fully equipped as like the hospital down the street. But yeah, it was yeah. it was still pretty cool. Hideous fever, but. Yeah, I th I, there was basically a period of 14 hours when I did not tweet or look at my phone because yeah. I was busy, you know, not trying to had, die of dysentery. And had very you ever been that sick before? No, was that... it was the sickest I've been in my life, yeah. hands down. And that's, I've By... gotten some pretty nasty food poisoning before. You know, I've it, it was the worst. I felt. It was that eight-hour period, I think, between like noon and 8 or 9 p.m. where I just felt <sighs> awful. And so when I in the moments where I had sort of cognizance about me, I did feel like really saintly, but also bad about just like thinking about children in the developing world in particular who would have to deal with this and how terrifying yeah. it must be and how terrifying it must be to be a parent of a child yeah. who's yeah. suffering from this wretched disease. But yeah, so I, I woke up or I kind of came to not woke up, but I, I checked my phone around like 10 PM and I uh, just flood of messages from people. Some people like I hadn't talked to since high school being like, are you alive? Are you Okay. Um, which was very flattering. And I, I felt very loved. And a lot of people on Twitter being like, is he we dead? We were all cheering for you. Yeah. Right. And so there was, but that was that, that 14 hour gap was just like the worst Friday of my entire life. But again, I mean, I signed up for it and I don't regret it at all. Would you do it again? I would do it again. So they, they asked me this question specifically uh, in the trial. <laughs> I would do it again if I could re-roll the dice. Like if you told me you're going to do this again and you will uh, be the person who gets it the worst, I'd probably yep. hesitate or like, mm, can we talk a little about maybe $10,000? Yep. But, but for 50-50 chance 50 of getting chance, the vaccine? Yes. Like I, oh, again, I knew what I was signing up for. Yeah, It's for a good cause. And so it's, I, again, don't regret it. Honestly, a lot, a lot of it was just kind of, you get kind of bored. I couldn't go outside. It was, you know, it's spring. And so things were starting to get nice out. And we just kind of had to sit there and stare out the window. Yeah. How work. many total days were you locked up? I was there up? for 11 full days. 11 got, full days. Because okay. I was, I got it so bad. Uh, and I was put on antibiotics early. I was released a day earlier than most other people, or at least yeah. some other people. So the full time we had allotted for it was 12 days. With the understanding that we might get out a day or early, one other person who had a pretty gross fever on Friday, got it early. And I think we're let out early. You're like the young guy. You weren't supposed to get it the worst. That's what I thought. I was like, I have a great immune yeah. system and I'm 20 something. So I'm invincible yeah. and this should not have happened to me. And I'm very <laughs> annoyed. And so, yeah, it was definitely destroyed that yeah. myth where I'm, it turns out I'm not invincible, yeah. unfortunately. But yeah, it was, I definitely did not expect it to be, I mean, I knew dysentery was bad. But I was like, you know what? I'll be in good care. <laughs> <laughs> like I knew it was going to be bad. I rationalized it in my mind to keep myself from freaking out, being like, you know, it probably won't be that bad. But fully intellectually knowing, like, no, it's it yeah, it would be bad, and it's gonna suck. Yeah, but yeah, so there's definitely some cognitive dissonance there. Yeah. What were the other participants like? Without giving away their details, right. but what what sort it of people were involved in? So there were a couple other twenty somethings, a lot of like college and grad students. I had never really thought about people like 
you know, thought really about clinical trials before and the model that we have. And so a lot of people had done like a bunch of these and they were talking about like, which faci- like, which farm comp, like pharma companies have better facilities and blah, blah, blah. And I was very surprised, wow. I guess, by that. Like professional clinical trial people. Basically, like a lot of people who are oh. like retired or semi-retired, or not, I guess mm. not, not many retired people because the age limit was, I think, 49 or 50. Once you get older, this like shigella, shigellosis is a much greater risk. And so, but yeah, that was an interesting aspect to it as well. And so, like I said, I'm not a saint, but like a big motivator for me was like, there are definitely better paying studies um, out there. I'm a little, I, I was very hesitant to kind of become a guinea pig if it, I was not drawn to the idea of becoming a guinea pig for a treatment that would not be made widely available. And so the Center for Vaccine Development and also Pasteur in France have been developing this this vaccine for what is a neglected disease that kills, by some estimates, tens of thousands of children per year in the developing world. And because it's that these are state institutions slash nonprofits, there's much less risk of, you know, it, if the vaccine is successful at being developed and then price gouged and not mm. uh, not deploy where it needs to be. And, yes. and one of the reasons that it's not developed by big pharmaceutical companies is because the profit motivation. It, I mean, it, the people sure. who need it the most are the poorest in the world. Um, and yeah. so the the return on investment there is low. And so that falls yeah. on the state and nonprofits and charities to kind of pick up that burden. And so that was yeah. one of the reasons where that what was one of the motivators for me. And so I was kind of surprised to learn that that wasn't, I guess, quite as motivating a factor for other people. And I think that might just be, for me, it might be a class thing, like $7,300 uh, seven, you know, $7, is a decent chunk of money. But the ideological factor for me was also a big one. And I don't think it was as big for a bunch of the other participants. But mm-hmm. frankly, we didn't, we, I, you know, it was kind of a bummer because we didn't really spend a whole lot of time hanging out or anything. Like it was, um, yeah, um, I was a few that. acquaintances, but it was very much kind of like there was no game uh, night, right? The, the doctor Chen, the attending doctor, actually made a really funny comment. He's like, "Yeah, the, the cholera studies are usually more fun because it's a gross disease, but like you don't feel as bad." He's like, "You're just going to the bathroom a lot. It's so people are playing <laughs> ping pong and foosball, whereas once you get shigella, it it, it really oh, knocks great. you down." And so, uh, I, which I thought was hilarious. The idea it's like the cholera studies are more fun is kind of a, a hilarious, <laughs> Sign me yeah, up. hilarious phrase. Um, <laughs> if, yeah. But uh, yeah, so I didn't really get to know a lot of the other participants well, unfortunately. And it, it was pretty diverse background, but there were no millionaires or billionaires sitting in there, obviously. Like there's definitely okay. a class aspect to it too, which I think mm, is interesting, interesting to think about. Yeah. Um, and I know that, that that plays into the larger discussions about the ethics of clinical trials yeah. and pay participants in so far as it seems within bioethicists, there's the argument that, you know, if we pay too much, people will stop consider like people will be so attracted by the money that they can't make it reasoned and informed. Cons- they cannot make the reasoned and informed yeah. consent necessary to uh, like uh, really ethically participate because they will write off the uh, the allure of money will be so great that they will write off like what could be very serious risks. Sure. Um, so that was an interesting thing to think about too. Yeah. And I've been thinking too about a lot about this tax structure and stuff like that, but. And how yeah, functionally, this yeah, this is not you, income, <laughs> right? When, and when you tax yeah. like that, because of the the demographic makeup of of uh, participants, it's functionally a regressive tax. And so, I think there's an argument to be made because again, millionaires are not doing this. Is anyone advocating for this? Yeah, or is this something? I am that... in the process of writing a, a ranty little op ed about it because cool. I do think. I mean, I think I living in DC, I could be the first to tell you that Congress is not a particularly functional body, but I feel like it would not be yeah. hard to sell as a as a sort of add on in an appropriations bill. Telling Republicans here's a tax cut, albeit a uh, rather obscure one, should not be that hard to sell. And then for progressives and liberals, again, a this is subsidizing public health functionally, yeah. and also again this is a regressive tax, and so it's one that should not be in Absolutely, place. Yeah. I think there's a reasonable argument to be there made, yeah. uh, to be made there. Again, yeah. I will fully admit that it's also one that I would love to see implemented before April 15th of next year because I don't want to pay taxes on them. <laughs> <laughs> so there's certainly a self-interested You're, aspect yeah. of it. But I also I, in yeah, in terms of like public policy like is given that taxes are incentive structures like there should the state has a compelling interest at least for like neglected diseases and cancer and things like that. Like this, there's a compelling state interest to make sure that clinical trials are well, like that there are participants and there's definitely yeah, someone for whom $7,300 is enough. But when you factor in the taxes, you know, maybe the 5,500 like that, yeah. like there's a utility curve there. And huh. I'm sure, I mean, cause if I could tell you that if it were only $3,000, I would be like, nope, I can't yeah. maybe tell you the exact bright line, but taxes yeah. are definitely a big part of that. And it's like, yeah. you're, you're, you're minimizing or you're decreasing the amount of total compensation, which is sure. one of the primary ways that you recruit participants. And so 
again, that's something the state can take care of and the government, I think, should get on. There's a lot of ethical considerations around clinical trials overall. What would be your thoughts on if they were to conduct these clinical trials in the same sort of protected medical setting, but in the countries where dysentery is most common? And, well, and I know that they're doing that with this yeah. trial too. So I joked okay. a lot in my, my Twitter thread about wanting to compete with the French. Um, this, this vaccine mm. has been under development. I mean, it looks like for over a decade. And again, as a non-medical professional, I knew it's like, oh, these probably take some time. Um, I, I reading more about this, I definitely became much more attuned to the massive amount of effort and resources that goes on into developing yeah. these these medications and medicines and, and vaccines in particular. Also, to Pasteur is running parallel trials in Kenya right now. Are they getting the same compensation? I mean, that's... I would imagine not. I would be shocked mm-hmm. if they were. And so that is a kind of thorny ethical issue. It's like, to what extent... Yeah. Do we want to, the idea of like intuitively, morally, the idea of offshoring these nasty disease trials to poor countries because we can get away with paying them less does not sound fun. Sure. And I know I was reading um, a study recently on a meta-analysis of studies on the motivations of healthy participants in clinical trials and our, the compensation, you know, in the West, particularly several thousands of dollars. And it, there was one in Malawi that was literally like 50 kilograms of corn or something like that with a market mm-hmm. value of like 15 US dollars. And so, and each of those studies had different, mm. was, it was not all the, you know, getting dysentery. So they were not directly comparable. That kind of struck me. It's like, yeah, like they pay in absolute terms a lot less than what we do in yeah. the West. And so that's definitely, but at the same time too, you can't, I'm sure for methodological, methodological and reasons, you probably should be testing these in the countries that are yeah. much more at risk um, demographically. Well, and giving them that sort of that sort of compensation is life changing and, and right, yeah. And so, I mean, I again like that kind of just. There's no way to solve for global inequity um, and inequality with clinical trial payment. So, I mean, I think as long as you can make a comparably like important contribution to someone's income in a developing country with clinical trial participation, like that yeah. is morally sufficient. Well, and somehow it feels better to be doing the clinical trial here to help children in a developing country versus children in a developing country participating in a clinical trial to help people here in the yeah. U.S. And I mean, so. if I know for dysentery, they would definitely not ever give this to a child. Um, yeah. There was like, uh, I mean, one of the excluding conditions for us in the study was like, they wanted to make sure that we weren't, we didn't live with or regularly care for anybody under the age of five or over the age of, I think, 60. Um, oh, interesting. Just, and, I mean, it's kind of the Swiss cheese model where it's like, we they tested us extensively. Huh. They gave us antibiotics, they killed yeah. off the bacteria. They tested us in our stool consecutively over a 24 hour period to make sure that we were negative in two consecutive tests. And then they wanted to make sure that it somehow we still had it, that it, the minimal, there'd be a minimal chance of an outbreak because, you know, we weren't living with someone who was, we couldn't be food service workers. Oh so that gosh. was an exclu- excluding condition. Oh, interesting. Um, we couldn't. Ugh, can you imagine anyone. the headline? Right, exactly. So like they, it, was, it was funded by the Gates Foundation too. Um, so it was. That so that would have been that would, a that would have been disaster um, yeah. and on many levels. <laughs> so uh, yeah, they there was, it was just kind of a, it was a Swiss cheese model of like making sure that on the off, off, off chance that one of us escaped and released back in the wild with Shigella that there would be ample time and there would be minimal risk to the public or other people who are most vulnerable in terms of like yeah. life-threatening sort of uh, consequences. So that was something I came to appreciate too. It's like, there's a lot of planning that goes into these things and the amount of effort they make to ensure that there is minimal chance of risk or harm or long-term harm to participants, which I yeah. appreciate it because... Yeah. Because <laughs> you didn't die. Right. Because I don't die. <laughs> We'll be right back after the break. Has your chronic illness made it difficult to continue working in the traditional way? Want to learn how to find and create flexible remote work that both accommodates your chronic illness and generates an income? Join the Patients Getting Paid membership, a community of chronicpreneurs where people just like you find workshops and trainings, weekly updated condition-specific gigs, twice-monthly coaching calls, co-workings, accountability, and the kindest community to support you on your path to make money while working from anywhere and taking good care of yourself. Learn more or join us at patientsgettingpaid.com. (laughs) 
So have to applaud you for using your moment of Twitter fame to raise money for a water (laughs) nonprofit. Can you tell us about the nonprofit you chose and how much you raised? Yeah, so it's called The Water Project. And at this point, I think it's still open and it stays open for another couple months. We're at $24,000. I would love to see it reach $25,000. They okay. construct and maintain basically just clean water facilities in particularly villages across sub-Saharan Africa. Shigella is spread by everyone's favorite, the fecal oral route, um, primarily. So that means for places that don't have adequate public sanitation infrastructure, the risk is particularly severe because if the water supply is infected, then everyone's screwed. And not only Shigella, obviously, many waterborne illnesses like that can can be spread via just contaminated pump or anything like that. So they build anything from water, like, I mean, even sometimes just rain collection and storage, uh, secure kind of storage infrastructure for villages. And so I kind of, I guess on Sunday or Monday after I was sitting around being like, wow, like checking my Twitter analytics, because I, am again, I, like I said, attention for social media was a, was definitely became a little bit of a motivator <laughs> for this, for better or for worse. It's a good story. Yeah. Um, and, you know, social media is a drug and you just open it and you're like, I have 20 notifications and people are calling me a good person. This is fun. Definitely cannot <laughs> deny that that was, that was uh, a part of it. And so I just started poking around doing some research, wanted to find a good charity star and, you know, rated a charity that would kind of, however, slightly push the needle on this. Ultimately, you know, I understood that if this vaccine, I mean, this is still years out, probably they'll have to do phase three trials, things like that. Like, and a vaccine is not going to be the panacea. Like it's going to be an important part of a broader public health strategy. And part of that, like you inevitably will have to just provide clean water for people. And so, um, again, I was feeling very emotional after recovering from what was the worst 12 hours of my life on that Friday. And was like, you know what, I want to see if I can use some of my 15 minutes of internet fame to, raise some money and hope that some Mm. child in the developing world does not have to put up with this. Well, we'll link to that. Yeah. We'll link to that in the blog. I, my original goal was like maybe $2,000. That might be a little much. Um, and I was almost moved to tears basically the next day when I checked it and one anonymous donor too kind of responded to a snarky tweet of mine with a donation of $10,000. And I was floored. I mean, I've been really moved by it and I uh, really appreciate that people were able to kind of take something positive from my manic tweeting about diarrhea. So that was, I mean, that was the kind of thing I didn't even really think about beforehand. Obviously, again, I was not particularly expecting to go minorly viral for it. In respect, I wish I thought of it even sooner and been more aggressive about promoting it, but you know. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, well, any any listeners that are interested will link to it. But yeah, I think what was so cool about following your story was just getting that inside look of a clinical trial from the participants' standpoint. So I think it was just primed to kind of go viral um, within kind of med Twitter. Did you get any feedback from non-med Twitter, maybe anti-vaxxers or anyone that... Yeah, um, so you know. I will say it was very interesting because I, I mean, I used to work in the foreign policy sphere and I speak Chinese and like a lot of my professional life has has involved kind of Chinese foreign policy analysis and things that are very much of a separate world um, and a very niche little DC bubble. And so I was kind of expecting it to be interesting to maybe those people who don't yeah. know anything about medicine, um, like me. And also it was just kind of intending it to be like, hey, here's an FYI and why might be MIA for a while. And so I was very surprised when it when it pretty rapidly, within 48 hours, had like a lot, you know, respect, respected immunologists and public health researchers and bioethicists were like, wow, look at this. And I was like, I'm just some guy. Like, I don't like, <laughs> I'm some dude who's also like, can't even read the manual properly. So I keep tweeting out things that are just wrong about this trial. Like I called it phase two C. <laughs> I like thought I was going to get infected the first day. And again, this was all information that they had like explained to me probably like 10 times. And I was just like, eh, whatever. Mm. Um, I'll fly by ear or I'll, I'll go by uh, whatever the yeah. phrase is. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll wing it. Um, <laughs> yeah. The response was overwhelmingly positive. I've had a few viral tweets before and uh, never has it been like a uniformly positive experience where people are nice and supportive because it's Twitter. Um, So that's not the most common uh, uh, form of attention you get on Twitter.com. In terms of anti-vaxxers, I also have to compliment Twitter in the sense, which is first, in the sense that there was a blip of them at first. Uh. And, but... It might have just been part of the network effect, like the people who were retweeting me were mainstream media figures and you know respected health researchers and doctors and and so on and so forth. And so I imagine there's not a whole lot of overlap with the like COVID is a you know bioweapon that's gonna activate the five G towers and like the vaccines, like all of that stuff. Like I don't think that there is there's a network effect there, I think too. But for the most part, I really didn't receive any sort of issues with that. There were a few little blips in the beginning, but people were super supportive. Those folks might have already been blocked by the people responding yeah. and retweeting. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, I had to block a couple of people, but really not 
far fewer than I expected, I think, when I started to go viral. I was kind of bracing myself. I was like, oh, God, like I'm about to get hit with some really stupid crap, aren't I? But thankfully, that did not materialize. Well, I was, I was literally, I definitely was literally hit with some stupid crap, but uh, not, not on the internet. <laughs> So you, um, for fun, edit Wikipedia, and (laughs) you have said that you care about how knowledge is transmitted. How does that kind of like ethos of your life relate to this experience? Absolutely, I think. I mean, I edit Wikipedia because I'm a dork, and I have too much time on my hand and like to research. And one of the things about Wikipedia, I mean, Wikipedia, for better or for worse, is for many of us like a go-to source. I read, you know, an ungodly amount of articles on Wikipedia every day, just like on the bus, I'll like pass a monument and be like, I wonder what the history of this is. And then like 15 minutes later, like the history of Scottish Freemasons and, you know, 1877 sort of thing, those like rabbit holes. And I started editing a couple of years, editing a couple of years ago. And just the way that knowledge is again, transmitted on Wikipedia, what we consider a reliable source or not, those are all intensely debated in the epistemology and the scientific reasonability of all those things is, is very much a consensus driven discussion. And it's one that's fallible and subject to a lot of issues, but Wikipedia has a really, really good job of protecting against COVID disinformation and being very, very good and proactive about keeping that sort of misinformation off of its pages. And frankly, it's a little bit better in many ways than websites like WebMD, which will still kind of entertain what I consider to be pseudoscientific practice, um, like functional medicine Mm -hmm. and things that don't have a really solid clinical uh, evidence-based backing. WebMD will, like, for instance, not to call them out specifically, but to call them out specifically, will have kind of those articles that that validate that stuff. On uh, Wikipedia, yeah. sometimes to a fault, it gets kind of that that gets smacked down pretty easily. But even then, I, I was just thinking, and part of this goes back to my work on China stuff. You know, I've done a lot of research on atrocities that are occurring against Muslims in Western China in the region of Xinjiang, and that includes internment camps, re-education camps very credible evidence of forced labor. And I kind of sit on the left of the spectrum. And so there are definitely people who have been skeptical, who I know, who have reasonable skepticism of mainstream Western reporting and the United States government's kind of position on um, those atrocities. They they don't know what's going on. And so they're very skeptical that, for instance, Mike Pompeo, you know, does he really care about Muslim lives in China? Um, and I think those are fair questions to ask. And so what I started doing on my blog a couple like two years ago was taking the primary source documents from Chinese, translating them, analyzing them in the context of my knowledge of how the Chinese political system works, and so on and so forth. And that really got me thinking about what primary evidence is and how, I mean, and this is kind of frustrating now, I mean, reading fact-checking articles, even today, a lot of them really rely on just sort of like, you know, crazy COVID crank says this, but the science says this and just provide 18 citations and do a very, frankly, poor job of explaining the underlying scientific principles as to why, for instance, the claim that there's graphene oxide in that will kill you in the COVID vaccine, um, why that is a nonsensical claim and why that doesn't make sense. And that's hard to do. It's hard to write out that sort of article and explain in depth to a lay audience, like, this is why that is a nonsensical sort of uh, proposition. And what a lot of mainstream media does, and I think this is a function of the time constraint on journalists and the profit model, um, I think those fact-checking articles don't tend to get a whole lot of hits. So what the mainstream media does is just tend to kind of slap on a bunch of studies and citations and go from there. And those studies are usually entirely valid. But for lay people like me, it's a big step for us to kind of sit there. And I mean, I don't have the faculties to fully understand what's going on in those because I'm not a scientist. I don't understand modern clinical medicine in a way that is necessary to read a lot of these very dense studies. And so there's definitely a gap there, I feel like, sometimes in terms of how those facts and medical knowledge are transmitted and how they are presented in public and how there's a discord, uh, dis, uh, I guess, a disconnect there between what we understand, what me, like I as a lay person understand and what like um, kind of scientific consensus is. And I think that's one that's a little bit underappreciated. So yeah, I mean, that was definitely part of it. I was like, this is what a clinical trial looks like. I was very curious. I had no idea. And so I, I guess the silver, there was a, a benefit there of being able to kind of provide the insight into uh, how these clinical trials are run and what they look like and what the actual like step-by-step, like when I say, you know, when you tell an anti-vaxxer, you know, these have been run through clinical trials and approved for emergency authorization, are fully approved now by the FDA. You know, don't, very few of us understand what that means. Like we don't really know what a clinical trial is. And, you know, with COVID vaccines in the United States, Moderna and Pfizer were not approved by challenge trials. AstraZeneca was in the United Kingdom. But regardless, like, I feel like sometimes it's easy to kind of be like, these were approved in clinical trials and, and not really understand like the amount, the immense amount of effort and scientific undertaking that that required. 
And so, yeah, I guess that's kind of, that relates to my kind of interest in, in how knowledge is transmitted, so to speak. Yeah. That's my very long-winded answer to that. Yeah. Well, so I have to ask, like, did you use any of your experience to do any edits in Wikipedia? Like, like do you <laughs> feel like updated... the Shigella page is good? No, well, no, the Shigella page is unfortunately not very good right now. Medical Wikipedia. Okay. So there's, there within Wikipedia, there are projects and medical Wikipedia, the med, med wiki project is very, is a, is a tightly run ship. Sometimes a little aggressively so, because it's important <laughs> information. Like, unlike most information on Wikipedia, like if you're not careful, you could get someone killed. And so, but it just depends on what articles they're fo- they focused on. Wikipedia has okay. an internal sort of like project-based uh, rating of, of articles. You'll see like a featured article, which is the one that changes every day based on that front page that you've seen. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes like some obscure battleship or something, but like those tend to be very good. And I think comparable to like peer reviewed research, they go through editing and review in Wikipedia's internal systems and are very well researched in general. And there are definitely diseases that have that kind of status where I actually prefer them to kind of more simplified, like valid medical explainer websites, but that tend to kind of dumb things down. The Shigella page is just has not been given a lot of attention. So it's not that great. I will say I did add the pronunciation for dysentery, the U S pronunciation for dysentery to the dysentery page, because it only okay. had dysentery from the British. And I was like, mm. that's definitely not how I say it. Um, <laughs> but I, I you couldn't help yourself. You it's had definitely to. crossed my mind. I like, I mean, Wikipedia is a passion project. And so I tend to I had a lot of yeah. China related stuff, but I, it's definitely been in the back of my mind. I kind of want to improve that yeah. page. But again, I'm, I'm a lay person and that's like kind of the essence of Wikipedia where it's like, I can, I'm a reasonably intelligent person. I would hope who can read through these studies, but there are definitely a lot of medically qualified editors who I think could do a better job, <laughs> but I definitely, I think we'll make a little few updates to it over the next coming months, just in terms of basic information. How many hours a week are you spending on editing Wikipedia? It depends. Um, like last month I had over a thousand edits in the month Ooh. this month i've done a little less i mean it depends it can be anywhere from like half an hour to like five or six definitely doing it a lot during the pandemic it depends i re- i in the past week or so i haven't been quite as active on it but it really does depend there's some i mean I, there's definitely been a saturday or two where i'm just a huge dork and i spent like eight <laughs> hours on it definitely i at the end of the day i'm like wow i really deserve to get like my head dunked in the toilet and swirly for this don't i but it's uh <laughs> Uh, it's a hobby of mine and it's one that I think is fun and, you know, real world impact. I'm a 20 something in DC. So frankly, even if I work for a think tank or something, a report you put out is probably not going to get a lot, as many views as the Wikipedia page for the corresponding mm. phenomenon, <laughs> which yeah. is not something that people at think tanks in DC like to be reminded of, but it's probably true <laughs> for a you lot seem, of yeah, articles. You seem to care about kind of like the impact of how you spend your time. Yes. Um, That's I great. want to be important and popular. No. Uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, I blog and like write about my own little things, but it definitely, I mean, for anyone, I think, you know, is this going to be read? Is this going to like move a needle on something to the extent possible is, is a question that I consider important that I ask of myself a lot. So what, uh, what's the best way for people to follow you? Um, you can follow me on Twitter, which is my okay. at is woke global times, which is a remnant <laughs> of my China watching days. The global times is kind of like Chinese Fox news. It's a very nationalist, hardcore kind of very bad outlet with very low factual uh. standards. And so my joke is kind of, I'm the woke version of that. And that's kind of the main way. Um, I'm not on Instagram a whole lot. I think it would have been very funny if I did a picture based account of my time on in dysentery camp, but that might've been um, a little too much for my friends uh, and might've gotten me kicked off the platform. So I was left to Twitter, but that's the best way to, to follow me. Well, if you have, if you do have some photos, send them to me, we'll put them up on the Heart of Healthcare website. Well, it will do. Awesome. Well, Jake, thank you for being here. Thank you for telling your story. Thank, thank you, you for so contributing much. to science. You're, <laughs> of course. Um, we all appreciate you. Thank you so much. It was great. Thank you for letting me rant and ramble about it for 45 minutes. If you're interested in checking out Jake's live tweets during the clinical trial, we've linked to them on our website, heartofhealthcarepodcast.com. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Heart of Healthcare. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, follow us on social, and tell all your friends to listen. The Heart of Healthcare is a product of Offscript Health. We are a healthcare engagement company built for patients and caregivers by patients and caregivers. Our executive producers are Matthew Zachary and Andrew McDowell. Our senior producer is Brianna Seely. Our intern is Antonella Sterniolo. Our host is Hallie Tecco. It is recorded, mixed, and edited by Brianna Seely. For advertising and media inquiries, email media at offscriptnot.com. That's media at offscript.com. For more information, visit offscript.com.